Okay, so today we'll be turning our attention to empires in Asia. We'll start with India before turning to look at China and Japan. Last week we looked very briefly at Islamic and Persian manuscript pages, among other things. And when we turn today to the period of the Mughals, we will see that the art of miniature painting, such as that that we saw very briefly last week with the Makamat of Al-Hariri, um, we will see that miniature painting was introduced to India from Iran. At the beginning of the 16th century, the greater part of the Indian subcontinent had long been ruled by the Muslim sultans. In 1526, two military adventurers from Turkestan, Babur and his son Hamayan, seized power and founded the Mughal Empire. Humayun was exiled to Iran, and it was there that he developed a taste for Iranian art, especially miniature painting. When he was released from exile, he returned with two artists from the court of the Iranian Shah. Under the rule of Hamayun's son Akbar, the Mughal Empire would be consolidated and extended from Bengal in the east and as far south as the river Godavari. Akbar inherited his father's great love of the arts, particularly illustrated books. The narrative quality of the images produced at Akbar's Mughal court is quite different from what his father found in the Iranian miniatures he loved so much. In other words, in Akbar's time, images were used to fully illustrate each detail of a story. The history of Akbar's long reign was brilliantly illustrated by one of his favorite artists, the Hindu painter Baswan or Baswan. Basilon is credited with creating the particular kind of narrative painting that the Mughal period became known for. This double composition that we are looking at was designed by Basilon and another artist, Chatar. So it shows the subject of an elephant fight, a very famous elephant fight. So we can see the elephants on this side of the illustration. Elephant fighting was a favorite sport of the court and one in which Akbar loved to participate. The occasion that is commemorated in this illustration occurred in 1561. The Emperor Akbar chose to ride Hawaii. This is the elephant that the Emperor is seated on here. And we can see him in his white outfit on top of the elephant Hawaii. And the elephant was known for his surly bad temper and his difficult character. The Emperor is, is on the elephant Hawaii and he's charging another royal elephant named Ron Baga. We can see all around that there are concerned onlookers and they have summoned the Prime Minister, Ataga Khan, to try and make the Emperor stop because he's putting his life at risk. When Ataga Khan arrived, he was horrified at the danger in which Akbar had put himself and the text records that the Prime Minister and all those around him, great and small, raised their hands in entreaty to God to preserve the emperor, as depicted here. During his reign, Akbar was known as the lion-hearted king of kings. So this suggests that he was very brave and he's, he's fearless. Seeing that Akbar was determined to continue his fight on the elephants, Ataga Khan hid his anxiety. Eventually, Ran Baga fled. This is the second elephant that we see running across this pontoon bridge here. 
energetically pursued by his opponent, Hawaii, and his royal rider. When they reached the river Yamuna, both elephants lumbered onto a bridge of boats, which lurched up and down beneath their combined weight, making those on the bridge dive into the water for safety, as depicted in the left-hand page. Finally, the emperor managed to restrain Hawaii, who was, quote, like a fire in disposition and like a wind in swiftness. So this was a famous elephant in his time, and his character was also noted in this book about the Emperor Akbar. The drama of the scene is emphasized by the turbulent water and the elephant breaking out of the frame of the composition. So it looks as though the second elephant, if he's to continue his path, he's going to run right off of the manuscript page. So this adds a sense of energy and dynamism and excitement to this illustration. So this is primarily how the drama is conveyed, by the turbulent water, by the elephant breaking out of the frame of the composition, rather than by the actual facial expressions of the people, which are fairly subdued. And this is common in Mughal manuscript illustration, that expression is shown in other ways, not in extreme facial expressions of the figures. Instead, concern, awe, and fear are conveyed by means of the standard gesture of Iranian painting. So this is imported into this example of Mughal painting here, in which onlookers lightly press a finger to the lips. So we can see some examples of that in the crowd of onlookers, that gesture that's been imported from Iranian examples of art. It may seem like a boisterous and light-hearted example, uh, but Akbar was to claim this particular event from his own history um, as something with symbolic meaning. He assigned great import to this event where he jumped on the back of the elephant. He maintained that he mounted Hawaii in order to put himself at God's mercy. The fact of his success and survival was thought to illustrate the origins of the vital power that enabled Akbar to be a great leader of men. So he's trusted himself into God's hands when he's embarking on these great adventures. The manuscript in which these images appeared was called the Akbar Nama, or the Book of Akbar. And it was commissioned by the emperor himself as the official chronicle of his reign. It was written by Abu al-Faisal between 1590 and 1596. And the paintings from this first royal copy, which exist only in partial form, were being prepared as the historian wrote his text. So this is an example of Akbar as emperor, uh, trying to record for posterity the great events of his reign. And he's combining his interest in recording his own life uh, with his interest in miniature illustrations in books. So as the text is being written, the artists in his workshops are hard at work developing the companion images to tell the story. We can observe a few things, technically and stylistically, about these illustrations. They follow the Iranian practice of drawing an outline, and we can see that most of the figures in these images have a black outline, have contour lines, and then the figures are filled with color. It is also very brightly colored, and all these complementary and contrasting reds, blues, greens and yellows are likely drawn from the traditions of Hindu art. So we might start to get the sense that the painting studios that were sponsored by Akbar as a great patron of the arts were quite eclectic. He's making use of artists who come from different backgrounds and who employ different traditions to create a whole new kind of style of Mughal painting in this period. <coughs> 
We can also see some evidence here of cross-cultural exchange, particularly as space recedes in the background of these scenes. That distance is suggested by the impression of figures and shapes getting smaller the farther back they are. This is a strong suggestion of the influence of European painting and early explorations of atmospheric perspective. Akbar's court was a very welcoming one, and this included Europeans and their visiting artists. And of course, many affluent visiting Europeans would have gifts, would have books to give to the emperor, knowing of his particular taste in manuscript illumination and small paintings. So we can start to see in the way things are depicted that not only is Akbar um, and his painting studio that he sponsors, uh, his artists are employing Hindu traits from Hindu art, Iranian traits, as well as European art. Just going to look very quickly at another illustration from this same Akbar Narma, this book or chronicle of Akbar's life. And this is an illustration of Akbar inspecting the construction of Fatapur Sikri. And we can see that the emperor is shown at the top of the scene, at the highest point, although also the furthest back. And we can identify him because he is wearing white, and also because he seems to have a couple of servants behind him who are sheltering him from the sun and from the elements. But again, we can observe all these bright, bright colors, the black outlines and the illustrations of the figures. And here he's shown directing the construction of the royal city of Fatapur, or the city of victory, later known as Fatapur Sikri. Akbar's son, Jahangir, was also his successor, and he too was a great patron of the arts. Jahangir had a particular fondness for miniature portraits, so this is a very specific division of miniature painting. He was particularly interested in portraiture. And the most important and influential painter of, miniature, of miniatures, Abu al-Hassan, flourished under his support. So what we're looking at here is a double portrait of Jahangir and a contemporary Islamic ruler, the Persian emperor Shah Abbas. So what do we see in this picture? What are some, some main features of it if we're just trying to identify what seems to be depicted here? Yeah, it looks like they're standing on top of a globe. They're standing on top of a representation of the world. Anything else? Yeah? Yep, they appear to be standing on a lion and a lamb. Yep. Yeah, we have these little figures of uh, cherubs or celestial heads with wings that seem to be supporting both the sun and the moon. So we have the big gold disk of the sun, and underneath it, the crescent of the moon, and then we have these two little angel heads that seem to be supporting these two planets. Anything else? Anything we might notice about the two figures? Yeah? Yes, exactly. So we've had a great question from the audience about how uh, one figure appears to be a bit more dominant than the other, even though they seem to be locked in a friendly embrace or a brotherly embrace. Uh, one figure is a bit larger, and he seems to be a bit more dominant, as though he's the more powerful figure. So these are all great observations. So one figure we've observed stands on a lamb, and the other stands on a lion, 
And we might also notice that um, the one that's standing on the lion is standing over more territory on the globe. And we can see that Jahangir is larger than the Shah, who is positioned as though he is almost bowing. They're embracing. But the smaller figure of the Shah almost looks like he's bowing in the context of this embrace. It's possible that this image was sent to Shah Abbas as a gift, as both a symbol of brotherly love, but also a lightly veiled reminder of Jahangir's power. So I just want to compare very briefly this illustration of Jahangir and Shah Abbas with an image that was produced around the same time, also at the Mughal court of Jahangir. It is further proof of a cultural crossover and exchange in this period. We can see that these two images use, they draw in many of the same colors. The type of illustration looks the same, but the subject is quite different. The subject of the deposition from the cross illustration is very obviously a Christian illustration. And we might at first find this a little curious in the context of the Mughal court. But it's proof of cultural crossover and exchange, an eclecticism of bringing together and mixing of different styles and elements. It will be a few weeks before we look at the burgeoning print culture in Europe, but this court miniature of the deposition from the cross indicates that by the 16th and 17th centuries, art was circulating across international borders. This is a curious illustration to have survived. It's painted in the Mughal style, using the particular colors and elements favored by Mughal artists. But it is a reinterpretation uh, of a, a lost Flemish print after a painting by Raphael. So it's quite a circuitous route to get to this Mughal representation of an Italian Renaissance image. So that original print after Raphael would have circulated likely as a black and white image. And the Mughal emperor or someone in his court likely sponsored the artists to add color to this, to reimagine this composition with color in the Mughal style. Mughal emperors were no less active as patrons of architecture and the decorative arts than of paintings. So here we're looking at a portrait of Jahangir's son Jahan, commissioned by one of the best, um, sorry, this is a portrait of Jahangir's son Jahan. And I'm only showing this as an illustration of how much basically the father loved portraits and was, it was quite common to have portraits painted in the Mughal court. But this particular prince that we're looking at, the future Shah Jahan, was the patron of perhaps the most famous architectural uh, project in this period. Jahangir's son Jahan commissioned one of the best known buildings in the world for his favorite wife, Mumtaz Mahal. So this mausoleum, uh, this, the Taj Mahal is a mausoleum built for his favorite wife. And it drew on the traditions of funerary buildings of the past, but was also creating something monumentally grander than, than all of those buildings. The domes are topped with lotus motifs, and we can see this principally on the largest dome. There's an upside down lotus blossom that caps the top of the dome there. As well as gilded finials. And these are these kind of spires that project out of the top of the domes. And at the top of each of these finials is a little golden crescent. Merging Persian and Hindustani decorative elements. So the building itself draws on a lot of different eclectic sources. 
The Taj Mahal was conceived as an allegory in stone of the day of resurrection. The Taj itself being a symbolic replica of the throne of God. Certainly the layout of the grounds with four intersecting water channels in the garden through which the Taj is approached symbolize paradise with its four flowing rivers as described in the Quran. So we're looking at one view, but on the other sides of the building, there's also a water channel that leads up to the building. So we can imagine that on each of four sides. The central section that we're looking at is a white octagonal structure faced with white marble and inlaid with precious and semi-precious stones. It culminates in an enormous white dome with flanking minarets some 140 feet high. The white marble exterior has the effect of changing color depending on the time of day, reflecting the light and water differently as the sun rises and sets. In some images at sunset, it appears to take on almost a, a pink glow. So we're just looking at a detail of that center section here. And this is the main Iran, the arch-shaped doorway and rectangular space that served as an entrance. So if we can imagine inside this arch doorway, there's a very shallow porch-like space. Around the doorway, we can see there are delicate floral and vegetal decorations and also Quranic inscriptions. So we have these, these floral and vegetal lines that are depicted, but we also have Quranic inscriptions that run around the door frames. Well, we most associate this building with this particular view. It's actually a complex. It's not just composed of the one central building. Rather, there are several buildings, including a guest house for the attendants in charge of maintaining the grounds and buildings. And there's also a small mosque on the site of this mausoleum. The grounds and buildings were arranged with harmonious proportions and symmetry. The shallow pools were lined with fruit trees and cypress trees. And there were beautiful floral and vegetal decorative elements and inscriptions around the doorways. So these are all symbols of abundant life, but mixed with things like the cypress trees, which are a symbol of death, it's, it's spanning one's whole life, basically, in the different symbols that are represented, while still alluding to this um, kind of garden of paradise, this perfect place of the afterlife. Symmetry and harmony were important to communicate the sense of paradise of the space. And this is something that we see overriding a lot of different elements of art and craft in this period. It was important not only in architecture, but in things that we have seen before such as the carpets that we looked at last week. And these are also sometimes interpreted as uh, prints that represent a heavenly garden or an ideal paradise. And we can see that symmetry is very important in these examples as well. We mentioned talking about this medallion rug last week, that it, at some later point in its history, it's likely been cropped because it's no longer perfectly symmetrical. But that would have been the initial kind of plan to keep that sense of harmony and perfect order. And just to look at another detail, if we go back to our first slide here, this wall, behind this wall or in the sides of it, are stairs that lead you up onto the plateau here through which you can enter the mausoleum. And we can see that even on the lowest part of that wall, we have these very delicate 
vegetal and floral motifs that are designed to uh, contribute to this sense of a garden of paradise, a peaceful, harmonious place. Okay, so we've been looking at some examples of courtly art produced in Mughal India. In the time of great transition between the 11th and the 16th centuries, as Buddhism was declining in India in favor of Islam and Hinduism, it was finding an ever greater foothold in China, flourishing under the Tang Dynasty, which dates from the 7th to the 10th centuries. So you might remember this image we looked at many weeks ago now of the seated Buddha. Under the Song Dynasty, however, other traditions were cultivated alongside those of Buddhism. While much Buddhist art in China was created for the public, such as the large seated Buddha in a cave, other practices that were essentially private also emerged in the Tang and Song Dynasties, such as landscape painting. Landscape painting in these periods drew on other forms of Chinese philosophy, such as Taoism and Confucianism. Landscapes tended to be produced for an elite few. Gentlemen amateurs who painted for a select group of like-minded men, and these are known as the literati painters. It was the legacy of the growth of a powerful intellectual class encouraged by the establishment of rigorous civil service examinations in the Tang Dynasty based on Confucian principles of morality and the creation of laws based on the natural order of society. By the Song Dynasty from 960 to 1279, the majority of government positions filled by scholars who became wealthy, prestigious, and powerful, uh, this kind of fostered these literati painters, this kind of government official class of scholars. When we say that they're amateur painters, we simply mean that they were not uh, obliged to paint for a living. So that's not meant in a disparaging way to say that they're amateurs, just that they did not have to paint for a living. They often were independently wealthy where they had these government positions that supported them. So their painting was purely for pleasure, for their own intellectual pursuits, and for sharing with small networks of like-minded friends. So the image that we're looking at here was painted during the time of the Northern Song Dynasty. And this is Fan Quan's Travelers Among Mountains and Streams. Fen Quan was one of the first great masters of Song Dynasty landscape painting. This is quite a large painting. It's about seven feet high. And the composition was very carefully ordered. It seems to unfold before our eyes in three distinct phases, helping the viewer progress through the scene as a kind of traveler. So in the extreme foreground, we have this rocky outcropping. And that's the kind of first stage that we're looking at. In the middle ground, there's a tiny group of travelers who are making their way with their donkeys or their mules on a dirt path. And their size is intended, their very small size, is intended to reflect how small man is in the face of nature. The elements of nature, um, the eternal elements of nature, the mountains, the trees, things that will outlast humans, um, really dwarf mankind. There's a transitional point from the mid-ground to the background, and that's represented, that transition is represented by this kind of white rising mist 
and it gives the impression that the, the largest item in the background, that large mountain, is really pushing up against the picture plane. So this is the, the third stage of the painting, the background. While the mist and the shadow conspire to draw the eye upwards to take in the mountain's height, vertical emphasis is further confirmed by a needle-thin waterfall, which we can just see in a crevice in the mountain here. So this is a very calm, peaceful scene, but there are very carefully placed elements designed to draw our eye through the scene, up the mountain, down the mountain. So we are taking a trip, too, along with these little travelers. The whole painting it was intended to create for the viewer the feeling of climbing a high mountain and leaving the world behind in favor of contemplation of a bigger spiritual purpose. And you might also be able to spot there are little tiny temples that are hidden in the the, the growth there, the outdoor growth. There's one on the corner here. There's another one up on this ledge. So there are very really small uh, proofs or evidences of man in nature, but they're dwarfed. They're very small in the face of this great natural scene. Fan Kwan and his works would provide great inspiration for later generations of painters known as the literati. Literati painting was conceived as a mode through which the Confucian, or the noble person, expressed his ethical personality. So literati painting was very much associated with ethics. This kind of painting was less concerned with technical showiness or skill. Literati painters specialized in plain ink for the most part, sometimes with minimal color. They put great emphasis on the idea that the style with which a painter controlled his brush conveyed the inner style of his character. Brush strokes were seen as expressions of the spirit more than were matters of composition or skill in realistic depictions. So personal style and expression was more important than strict or slavish naturalism. The Mongol conquest of China began in 1210 at the hands of Genghis Khan and was completed by his grandson Kublai Khan, who crowned himself emperor of the Yuan dynasty in 1279. Economically disastrous and relatively short though the Yuan period was, it determined much in the future court of Chinese art. So we're talking now about the Mongol rule in China. The Mongols were interested especially in the decorative arts and they introduced the manufacture of carpets, commissioned fine metalwork, and promoted great varieties of form and color in ceramics. And this was the kind of lasting effect in the arts on the production and appearance of objects. The Yuan court in what is now Beijing saw the production of both secular and religious art on a large scale. Kublai Khan had a particularly varied network of advisors and officials, and increasingly networking and mercantile paths to other parts of the world, including France and Italy, developed. So we might think back to our class last week when I, I showed you a couple of Northern Renaissance paintings that showed Turkish carpets in Northern Renaissance artworks. And that's not the only kind of exchange that is going on at this time. The textiles in this Italian image are very uh, black. They've oxidized over time. But the representation of St. Louis of Toulouse here, he's shown wearing an oriental robe in this particular image. So the influence of the Mongol court is traveling, is being um, artists all over the world are being exposed to this kind of art and to the influence 
So we find even in Italian painting at this time, there's some evidence of exposure to Chinese developments. And we also want to look very briefly at this example of blue and white porcelain. And this particular type of uh, ceramics was the result of the Mongols bringing together the Chinese tradition of porcelain making with Iranian traditions of uh, process and materials. So that very distinct blue, that cobalt oxide medium that is common to West Asian decorative arts, makes its way into the Chinese production of ceramics under the Mongols in the Yuan dynasty. And it carries on into the Ming dynasty and onward. So there was much in the way of artistic exchange that was happening, beginning in the time of the Yuan Mongol emperors. And it shaped how Chinese art would look from that point on. It was in the Yuan period that a rift developed between the official or the professional painters and the literati painters, who were also known as the scholar painters. The literati, often translated as amateurs to highlight the distinction between them and the professional artists who painted to earn a living, practiced painting as an intensely personal and private form of art in keeping with the philosophical and religious ideals of the intellectual elite. The distinction between the professional painters and the literati was primarily educational and also social. Only the sons of the most affluent families had access to classical and traditional teachings and could afford to practice painting and calligraphy without concern for its commercial appeal. So we're looking at one example of a literati painter during the Yuan period, and this is Chao Meng Fu. He was a junior official of the Imperial Guard when the Mongols captured Hangzhou, and the takeover distressed him so much that he left his official post uh, and retired to his estate for the next 10 years just to practice painting and contemplate life. Drawing on his knowledge of ancient Chinese painting, Chao Meng Fu primarily produced highly personal hand scrolls, such as this one. So when we talk about hand scrolls in Chinese painting in particular, uh, we're looking at a horizontal format. And at either end of this image, there would have been dowels attached, wooden rods principally, that would allow the image to be rolled up and then unrolled as you wanted to look at different sections of it. So these kinds of images are very intimate objects. They're very personal because they depend on the viewer under normal circumstances to stand or sit at a table with them and unroll them section by section. So this is an example of a hand scroll, autumn colors. And it draws on an old-fashioned style. So at this time, which was particularly difficult as the Mongols were making their way into uh, China, uh, a lot of the literati are kind of reflecting back on what they saw as an ideal past. And part of the way that they expressed this was to paint in a somewhat old-fashioned style, to interpret that old style very personally. You can see there's calligraphy included in this image. And the red stamps, as I understand it, are different indicators of collectors who owned this or had this in their possession at different times. This particular hand scroll was produced for a friend in the south of China, and it depicted the ancestral home of the friend. So again, we have this very personal subject matter that was produced by one friend for another. And this is very typical of literati painting as it develops in this period. Just to look at another quick example by the same artist. This is his sheep and goat. <laughs> 
For literary painters, it was less important to capture strict reality in nature in a descriptive way than it was to capture the essence or the spirit of what was depicted. And we see this here specifically with the goat, with the fuzzy texture of his coat that is suggested by these very dry brush strokes, rather than each hair being painstakingly outlined. And what the artist has captured really is this gesture, this characteristic gesture of a goat grazing. So in this case, he's captured the essence of the animal. We recognize it as goat-like. Some subjects have very strong symbolic meaning for the literati painters. For instance, bamboo shoots. And this is what we're looking at here, 10,000 bamboo poles in a cloudy mist. And there's a reason that bamboo was more popular in this period to paint than in any other period. A resilient evergreen plant, it was admired for its ability to bend without breaking under stress and to adapt. So this was adopted by the literati as a natural symbol for the Yuan period, which under the oppressive rule of the Mongols, um, it, it required an adaptability without conceding. In other words, to retain one's integrity under foreign hostile rule was much admired. So during this period, as I said, more images of bamboo were produced than in any other period. So we're looking at one example by a famous female Chinese artist, Guan Daosheng. And this was intended to express the perfect calm of the sturdy bamboo. Mist rises, but there's no breeze to disturb the resilient stalks in the foreground or the background. China transitioned out of Mongol rule into the Ming Dynasty, which lasted from about 1363 to 1644. The founder of the Ming Dynasty came from a poor indigenous family, and as he rose up through the military ranks to power, he managed to drive the Mongols out of Beijing and establish himself as emperor. As a result of his background, and his struggle with the Mongols, the Ming Dynasty was ruled by a court suspicious of the literati and of foreigners. Consequently, the emperor supported painters of the professional school rather than those of the literati. The divisions between the literati painters and those who worked professionally and for the official court hardened. Okay, I think we'll take our 10 minute break here and we'll reconvene at 5.35. Okay, so I think we'll settle back into our, our podcast and our lecture here. So we had just been discussing kind of a shift that occurred uh, with the advent of the Ming Dynasty after the Mongols have been overthrown and removed. And how at the court of the Ming Emperor, um, he was not from an elite background himself and he tended to support the professional class of painters who painted for a living rather than the literati artists who painted um, more for their own um, spiritual and intellectual pursuits. The professional class of painters most popular at the Ming court were highly skilled craftsmen who aimed to achieve marvelous effects through their use of colors, realistic or highly conventional representations of people or things, uh, they use spectacular detail and the applications of things such as shiny gold leaf to make their works appear even more special and precious. <laughs> 
The Ming imperial court employed many such artists, and others made their way in the world by selling paintings to wealthy patrons and customers. So when we distinguish between a patron and a customer, a patron is someone who might commission a very specific project or work. A customer might be someone who is buying objects on a more or less open market. So we can make those two distinctions between patrons and customers. While many of the painters of the professional class were educated to some degree, few of them possessed the literary background of the literati painters, and none of them made their way in life fulfilling the Confucian ideal of government service. So we mentioned primarily with the first generation of literati painters that most of them belonged to an elite class of government officials who were highly educated, and in their spare time, they are painting and writing poetry. The example of the painting we're looking at belongs to uh, a style known as decorative bird and flower. And this was a style that was engaged in by many professional court painters at this time. The particular artist here is Yin Hong. And the subject of this painting is hundreds of birds admiring the peacocks. The subject presents a metaphor for the homage that court officials paid to the emperor. So the largest and the most beautiful birds in the scene are the peacocks. And they represent the most affluent people at court, principally the emperor surrounded by smaller, less important birds. So there's, it's not a particularly deep message that's coded in this image, but it really appealed to the court at this time. It's highly decorative, you know, painstaking detail to represent these birds in all their respective plumages. And the simple message is that the lesser birds admire the greater birds. So there's an understanding of the social order. So this is an example by a literati painter at this time. So he's working kind of outside of the court, um, of what is officially sanctioned at the court. The artist of this particular piece, Don Chi Chong, was a high official at, in the Ming Dynasty. And he followed the literati tradition of painting, though not at court. He was responsible for giving a theoretical foundation to the literati tradition of painting. So prior to his theories that he wrote and recorded about painting and art, literati painting was a more organic thing that developed amongst small networks of people. Dong Chi Chang distinguished between the subject of nature and a painting of nature, noting that expression occurs in the brushwork of the representation rather than in nature itself. Accordingly, he borrowed from the art of calligraphy a formal vocabulary by which to define the brushwork in representational painting. He discussed things in terms of open versus closed forms, rising versus falling form, and voids versus solids. So we'll notice in some of these paintings, for instance, that there's a lot of white or negative space in which the artist has chosen not to represent anything. Oftentimes, this white space is part of the composition. It represents an important part of the environment that is being depicted without the actual intervention of the artist to put something in that negative space. It still serves an important part of the cohesive whole. As a result, the landscape attains a double reading, both that of abstract form and as a representation. So this is all the result of Don Chu Chong's um, theorizing about literati painting in this period. <coughs> 
he addressed the idea that line, while representing nature, matters because it conveys individual expression. It conveys the personality of the painter and his relationship with the subject matter. So that connection of the individual with what was being represented was very important for literati painting. The first Ming Emperor was fairly hostile to the scholar painters, and this pushed the practice of their art to even greater extremes, away from the formulas used by the court artists. So the last example of literati painters that we'll look at today is that of Shen Zhou's Poet on a Mountaintop. This example blends expressive poetry, which was likely written first by the artist, with the artist's personal interpretation of a landscape. Here, Shen Zhou is himself a tiny figure dwarfed by the scale of the natural world around him. So we can see him on the top of the mountain here, represented by very few brush strokes. The small human dwelling is almost buried in the trees. So if we look at all these varied lines and brush strokes, we can make out a temple or a dwelling structure in the mountains there. The scene is intended to capture the mood of the poem, which is written on the left side of the hand scroll. And it's almost like a, a thought bubble that you would find in a modern day cartoon. There is a translation of the poem in your Stockstead textbook if you're interested on page 218. So you can see in this very simple scene that there's a, a, a variety of brush strokes and dots um, to represent the different kinds of trees and vegetation. And all of these things, these washes, the different intensities of ink, represent uh, Shenzhou's personal style and are not really dependent on the influence of any other artist. And this is one of those examples where we might also think about the use of negative space. We can see all of this white space that seems to have been left by the artist, left white, but it suggests so much. Mists, cloud, snow. There's almost an economical use of brush strokes and line here. So you can see these two examples are quite different of the official professional style of painting and the very personal expressive style of the literati painters just in these two examples being produced in roughly the same period. Very, very different things that are happening depending on which um, sphere one circulated in, which social sphere or political sphere one circulated in. So we're going to turn to look at the art of Japan in this period. And depending on how our time goes, we may have time to start the art of the early Middle Ages. But I did want to draw our attention particularly to a few examples of the Buddhist art that flourished in Japan during the Heian period, 794 to 1185. Japan at this time borrowed many of the cultural and artistic aspects from both China and Korea. And this indicates that it was a very peaceful time amongst these countries, and it allowed for an easy exchange of both culture and ideas. However, by the beginning of the 11th century, rising militarism, political instability, and the excesses of the Japanese imperial court marked a shift in the way that many in Japan practiced Buddhism. They were drawn to a form of Buddhism that promised through simple faith 
salvation in the form of a pure land paradise after death. So what we're looking at here is a temple near Kyoto called the Phoenix Hall. And it is devoted to the particular Buddha of this branch of Buddhism that's being practiced at this time, known as Pure Land Buddhism. And the Buddha is referred to as Amida, A-M-I-D-A, Amida Buddha. So we won't linger too long on the specifics of the temple structure, but instead we're going to look at the central figure within the temple, a large representation of Amida Buddha, nearly 10 feet tall and made of wood that was then covered in gold leaf. It appears to be a very peaceful and welcoming figure, but also seems to light up. And this is in large part the result of the gold leaf that is applied to the surface. It reflects not only the light from outside, but also from the shallow pool of water that surrounds the figure. So we can imagine encountering the statue uh, as the water around it moves, as the light changes outside, it will have an effect on the gold leaf that the sculpture is covered in. You might notice that on the wall behind the figure of Amida Buddha are little figurines that seem to be affixed to the walls. And these are tiny carvings of bodhisattvas, those helpful beings who remain earthbound in order to help others on the path to enlightenment. Some of them are playing musical instruments. They're generally just little representations of enlightened beings surrounding the Buddha and meant to uh, encourage and bring peace to visitors to the temple. To really kind of fulfill that promise that the pure land paradise is waiting for those who, who can get there. So we know the name of the master sculptor who is behind the carving of this figure of Amida Buddha, and this is Jocho. He and his workshop developed a very innovative technique for producing these large wooden sculptures of the Buddha, and this is known as the joined block technique. Wood was challenging to work with, and still is, especially on a large scale. It's temperamental, and it changes according to the weather, shrinking when it is dry and expanding when it is humid. To further complicate matters, when sculptors are working with large blocks of wood, the surface can dry at a different rate than the core. So sometimes warping occurs. It's quite unpredictable sometimes how wood carvings will turn out over time. So in order to reduce the risk of shrinking or cracking, Japanese sculptors developed a special technique using assembled blocks of wood. And this allowed them to control the thickness and the density, and thus better control the risks of expansion, drying, or cracking. And this is also important when you're covering the wooden sculpture in something like gold leaf, um, you don't want that finish to crack or shift every time there's a change in the wood. So this joined block technique was really, very really beneficial to producing these large sculptures. So we can see from this diagram, um, to, to uh, create large statues, particularly seated in a lotus pose with the legs crossed in front, Sculptors first put together four large blocks, two by two. So this would be this part of the sculpture that is assembled first in the four blocks. And then additional blocks are put in the front to finish the creation of the legs and the lotus blossom underneath to form the legs and the lap. 
And as these pieces were assembled, uh, sometimes these centers would be hollowed out, again, to protect against um, unpredictability in the drying out of the form. In the beginning of the Kamakura period, Pure Land Buddhism swept Japan, becoming even more popular. And what we're looking at here is a kind of portrait sculpture representing a well-known itinerant or traveling monk by the name of Kuya. Kuya was famous for urging everyone he met to join him in singing chants of praise of Amida Buddha. Believers would have immediately recognized Kuya in this representation from his humble traveling clothes and carrying the staff that, that was used by travelers and pilgrims. This was a key feature by which they would be identified. And he was specifically known for carrying the staff with a deer antler at the top. So anyone who saw this sculpture at the time would have recognized the subject of it. The deer antler symbolized a moment in Kuya's life um, that caused him to convert to Buddhism. After killing a deer, he kept the antler to remind himself of the incident. Perhaps the most compelling part of this sculpture, though, are the, the little projections that seem to come out of Kuya's mouth. These are six little peg-like symbols and each of them is a tiny representation of Amida Buddha. The number six to reflect the number of syllables in the specific chant that Kuya was known for. So it's a particularly interesting representation not only of the figure of the Buddhist monk, but also trying to capture the song or the chant with which he was associated and with which this particular kind of Buddhism was associated. And even though, of course, these are different traditions, these are different examples from different cultures, we can start to notice an interest in representing um, text and representing a verbal expression in these different kinds of objects, right? In the case of Shenzhou's poet on a mountaintop, the poem that the, the poet seems to be saying is presented right next to him there. It's represented in that kind of physical way. And we can also observe that in the Buddhist example, the Japanese Buddhist example of Kuya preaching, where the symbols of his chant are um, presented to us in physical form. Okay. I think to make sure that we get through our material for next week, I'm going to start very, very briefly on Europe and its neighbors in the Middle Ages. This section of the podcast um, and the PowerPoint, I will attempt to put into next week's so that it will all be in one presentation. But in order to make sure we get through all of this material, I'm just going to talk for our last 15 minutes about Europe and its neighbors. This list of terms will, of course, be included in the PowerPoint. These are all appear in your textbooks for the readings for next week, so you can always refer back to them if you need to. Much of the first half of this lecture touched on intersections, on cross-cultural exchanges, and on eclecticism. The traditions and tastes of one culture are introduced into and begin to influence the art production of another culture. The early medieval period is no exception, representing a fusion of Christian elements, of Greek and Roman classical elements, and Celtic Germanic elements. In older textbooks, these Germanic elements are sometimes referred to as barbarian a general name for many different cultural groups 
derived from the Roman dislike of their uncivilized appearance in that many of them had full beards. That's where this weird barbarian comes from, as opposed to the clean-shaven Romans. The Middle Ages or the medieval period, these are more of those unfortunate terms that we are kind of stuck with over the passage of time. Medieval or Middle Ages, they suggest that this period from about 500 to 1400 is a kind of in-between period where nothing was as good as it was going to be in the future. For centuries, people thought of this as a long, low interval between the high point of the ancient classical world and what was perceived to be the beginning of the modern European world. And it suggests that in this period, artists and craftsmen were creating inferior and unsophisticated works. And this is definitely not the case, as we're going to see in the last few minutes of this lecture and in next week's lecture. What is important for a shift in that old understanding and unfair judgment against work from this period is to better understand the context of these works, their origins, and their sources, as well as their specific functions. As the power and presence of the Roman Empire declined in the late 4th and early 5th centuries, competition for political authority became commonplace among cultural groups, including the Huns, the Vandals, the Visigoths, the Franks, and the Gauls, among others. After the Roman Empire receded from Britain in the 5th century, Land and riches became of great interest to marauding Germanic, Celtic, and Norse peoples. They came to plunder, but also to increase their land. Anglo-Saxons controlled what had been Roman Britain, while Celts inhabited Ireland. In Scandinavia, the seafaring Vikings held sway. So one of the most striking examples of decorative art from this period is a clasp of pure gold that once secured the cloak or body armor to the body of its owner. This clasp was found at Sutton Hoo, and Hoo is another word for hill, on the east coast of England, in a ship burial under a mound as a memorial to an unknown East Anglian king of the mid-7th century. And there were many things found in this burial mound. Um, there were gold coins minted by the kings of Gauls, many pieces of silver that suggest there were uh, a lot of burial tributes to the person who was buried in this ship mound. It suggests the raiding and the trading practices of the people. So we're going to introduce two uh, terms here, zoomorphic, and animal style, and they are particularly associated with the art of this period, and we'll see why in just a minute. Not only on this clasp can we see knot work and interlacing serpent forms, so we can see around the borders of the Sutton Hoo clasp that there are these kind of serpentine snake-like forms that wind in against each other, and some of the, the tendrils have serpent heads or animal heads. But we can also see symbols of strength and tenacity. In each of the edges of the clasp here, there are two representations of boars, of wild pigs, with their tusks um, interlacing. They're fighting each other. I always have trouble seeing these things, but I can make out their curly tails at the end and their hind legs. Perhaps if you look at this, for a few minutes, you'll be able to find the two boars on each side. There are some better examples in Google Images if you want to have a quick look. So the symbol of the boars uh, are symbols of tenacity, of strength. They suggest that these were qualities that the boar uh, had for himself or wished for himself. This clasp from the Sutton Hill burial ship 
makes use of the cloisonné enamel technique, a specific technique which sets or solders the delicate gold metalwork in place first. So all of the gold that separates uh, and creates the shapes would have been set as the first part of this process. And then inserts of colorful glass paste, and in this case, sometimes precious jewels are inserted and followed at hot temperature until we get an enamel-like finish that gleams as though all of it is made of jewels. In the case of the Sutton Hoo clasp, there are also rubies inset into it, so we know that the wearer was a person of some importance. So this is another item that was recovered from the Sutton Hoo burial ship, and it allows us to look at other examples of zoomorphic or animal style, as well as that um, complementary interlacing uh, of, of knots and lines, known as ribbon interlacing. So this was a purse cover. Uh, it's hard to imagine, perhaps, how this particular object functioned, but if we think that attached to all of the, the edges here, there would have been a fabric or a leather pouch that hung underneath it, this cover or top would have been the top um, flap that opened into a pouch. So we see more examples of the animal style here. We see intertwining serpents, lots of knot work, four-legged animals, and also short, squat human figures. So first we might want to look at the, uh, the central images here, and this is a, an eagle represented attacking a duck. And we can see that it's symmetrical. So on either side you have the outer figure, which is the eagle, attacking the duck. And the way the forms are created, they're very, um, they're, they're dependent on each other to create the shapes. They're very closely put together there. We can also see representations of men on each side that are being attacked by vicious beasts on either side. And at the top, you know, this initially looks like abstract knot work, abstract patterning, but we can see that there are also animal and serpent heads on these long skinny figures as well. So I mentioned that the items we just looked at were found uh, in a ship that had been used um, as a burial mound. And this was not simply a practice for Vikings abroad. A similar burial ship was found at Osberg in Norway as the main feature of a royal burial. It was covered under a mound of earth. So it was a practice among the Vikings to represent their ships as sneak-bodied sea creatures. The Osberg ship seems to have been the burial site of two women of some social importance, likely a queen and her maidservant. They were buried with a cart and two sleds, and evidence suggests that 12 horses, several dogs, and an ox were sacrificed to accompany the women on their journey to the afterlife. By the time of its discovery in modern times, the ship had long been stripped of its luxury goods, but the ship itself had some very well-preserved elements, including its prow, showing the detailed carving of interlaced beastly bodies. And this is what we're looking at here. So there are interlaced animal figures in this strip and also the outer strip. It's perhaps easier to see the animal elements in the remnant of this post, which was also found with the Osberg ship. The animal head in particular combines one in one composition the image of a roaring beast with protruding eyes flaring nostrils and pointed teeth, which are somewhat broken off, 
The expertly carved neck and head contain tight masses of serpentine lines. It's a powerful, expressive example of the union of both interlacing knots and the animal style. Also among the goods found in the Osberg ship were textile-making materials that the queen would have used in her lifetime. Her spindles and looms for weaving, and her frame for spinning or braided textiles. Viking women used these tools for making fiber arts. Women wove clothing and garments, but they also produced wall hangings and the waterproof sails for ships made of unwashed wool, the natural oils in which would have protected against the elements. So I don't have any pictures to show you of this, but there were some textile fragments that were also found in this burial mound. Because of its remote position, Ireland escaped occupation by the Romans in the first and second centuries, as well as invasions by the Germanic hordes in the fifth century. In the early fifth century, St. Patrick introduced Christianity to the Irish, and during this time, Irish monasteries became a haven for European scholars. They were protected somewhat in this isolated location. There was a flowering of Christian art in Ireland and various other islands off the coast of northern Britain. So the art produced in Ireland and off the coast uh, became known as Hiberno-Saxon, or insular art. Hiberno refers to the ancient name of Ireland, and insular means island, referring to the distinct blend of Celtic knotwork interlacing organic patterns and animal imagery, all of these things that were produced there. Principally, these are terms that are associated with manuscript production, but there are also surviving examples of Hiberno-Saxon or insular metalwork. So we're going to look at one example today of um, an early illuminated manuscript. These are hand-decorated pages that often include text, but in the examples that we're looking at, they are primarily illustrative. Great numbers of these kinds of texts were needed because of the growing significance of the Bible to the spread of Christianity. Most were made in Western Europe before the age of the printing press. Medieval manuscripts were produced in Monastery Scriptoria, the plural of scriptorium. Monks were by and large the only people educated enough to copy and decorate such manuscripts. It's not entirely clear the kinds of tools that monks had access to to produce illustrations, though it seems that rulers or straight edges were available. Pigments seem to have consisted of ground minerals and animal or vegetable pigments. They were mixed with water and then bound in egg white to thicken the consistency. And most often the ground or the substrate that's being worked on is vellum made of calf skin. This particular book, we're looking at a page from it here, uh, is known as the Book of Duro. It was produced on the Scottish island of Iona, and it included the four books of the Christian Bible known as the Gospels. Each Gospel is associated with one of the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And each of the evangelists was associated with a particular symbol. In the early Middle Ages, the symbol of the evangelist Matthew was the figure of a man. So this is the page that headed up um, the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. Eventually his symbol would become an angel. What we see here is a facing page that would have preceded the text to the Gospel of St. Matthew. It's a curious composite representation of the saint, 
His feet are in profile, or his arms, perhaps hidden under his cloak, his armless body, faces frontally. So we can just make out the, the front of Matthew's body here, or the, the figure's body, uh, and his face, and the outline of his hair. It just barely survives on the page there. This is another example also from the book of Duro. And in this case, we're looking at the Lion of St. John. Very early on, this was the symbol of St. John. It would later change to an eagle. The lion is represented in profile, its mouth open and its teeth bared, as if growling or roaring. And we might make note of the dense patterning on the surface of the lion's body that's comprised of red and green diamond shapes. These are accentuated by a yellow outline that merges into a stylized muscle, yellow and red feet, and green and brown striations towards the end of the tail. And we can see similar to the page we just looked at, they're framed by this border of knotwork. So these are relatively early illuminated pages. When we look at one that was produced only a few years later, this is a much more elaborate example of what is referred to as a carpet page. And many illuminated manuscripts at this time had this kind of carpet page. And they get their names because the very dense pattern design work really does look like an elaborately uh, made carpet. So this particular example is referred to as a cross and carpet page. Uh, we can make out the large cross that is embedded in the pattern here. It's comprised of a very dense network of lines and knots that interlace with each other. If you look very closely, you can make out um, their serpentine and animal forms hidden in the knot work in this very detailed line work. It's quite a rhythmic pattern charged with energy. And yet these things are controlled by that sturdy structure of the cross that seems to be laid right on top of that dense network of pattern. It's a very elaborate design work, and we might wonder at the reason behind this. It suggests that manuscript illumination reflects the intimate nature and close use of objects such as this, designed so that the reader could spend hours examining and reflecting on the smallest of details, perhaps helping to focus their reading and prayer, but also perhaps offering distraction as well. If any of you watch the TV show Vikings, this is where the character of Athelstan was kidnapped from, this monastery on Linda's farm. So I think we will leave off with this page from the Linda's farm gospel, and we'll pick up with early medieval art next week. Please get in touch with me or your TAs if you're having any questions or problems with your essays, and uh, you know, start thinking about which deadline might be best for you for that assignment. Thanks very much. Uh, some of it might appear on the final exam. Yeah.